Hello and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle and thank you for joining me at www.sonic-cinema.com. Before we get started, thank you for anybody who has joined the Sonic Cinema Patreon at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. I've got some more rewards coming up this month, have more looks at music. I've got some music that I'm planning on sharing. I've got audio from uh, different podcasts and different uh, commentaries from years past that I'm going to share, as well as some more from the book that I'm writing, Why is the Rabbit Wearing Sunglasses? So I hope you uh, take a chance to check that out at patreon.com backslash sonicsema. I'm very excited about this episode. This is the second part of a conversation that I had with an old school friend of mine, Stuart Delaney, and uh, he, we uh, did the first part of his part of this uh, conversation for his podcast, Snarky Faith, where we talked about faith in filmmaking, basically faith based films and the typical lack of quality in them. Uh, we continued that for Sonic Cinema. And breaking down specifically in discussing aspects of Mel Gibson's 2004 film, The Passion of the Christ, which was my choice. And it was a choice that I made because I, I feel like Passion of the Christ uh, has a pr very particular place in the history of faith-based films. Not just as the highest grossing faith-based film of all time, but also in terms of how those movies became marketed and that's one of the things that we discuss as well as specific aspects of the film itself so i hope you enjoy this conversation i'm also going to be linking to the uh, snarky faith part of the conversation in the link in the uh page here for this podcast and i hope you enjoy it Thank you very much for joining me today, and uh, with me is a uh, friend from high school and uh, my childhood who I uh, joined him for his uh, his show, Snarky Faith, and uh, he's joined me on the Sonic Cinema podcast, and we're going to sort of continue the discussion somewhat that we were having on his show, but it's going to be more specific towards a certain movie. It's going to be Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Uh, please welcome uh, Stuart Delaney to the uh, show. Stuart, thank, thank you so you much. much. Oh, I, I'm excited to be here, Brian. Um, yeah, let, let's. You know, I'm excited to talk about some movies. Yeah. So the big movie, I the reason I chose Passion of the Christ is because it is such. It's such a big uh, flashpoint in terms of faith-based films and religious films that we talked about on your show. Yeah, and it is the is quite easily the highest grossing faith-based or religiously themed movie of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, start off with, Stuart, was to sort of get your history on the film. And especially as somebody who is, as, as a person of faith uh, in general, sort of like what your impressions were on the film in a very uh, general sense. No, that's good, and and it's it's very applicable, Brian, that that you're having this show. We're like we're in the the midst of Lent, uh, <laughs> marching towards Easter here for this. And gosh, um, thinking back, I remember I remember watching the movie back in the day, and it for me it was it ended up being you know there there's a me many years ago watching it, and then there's the me now watching mm -hmm. it. Um, and they're, and they're very different people, but I, I remember being very sucked in to just the whole visceral nature of being able to see, I mean, we really, I mean, this was kind of just basically like, let's watch a documentary on what it was like for Jesus to die. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and all the feels and all of the guts and all of the flings and all of the fun that, that accompany, but for, for me, it was. And, and we talked about on on my show a few earlier, like what what for me it was, I guess, watching it, it really seemed to be it was a movie that almost didn't need dialogue. Yeah. Um, 
you know, w which I think does speak to, you know, however people feel about, about Mel Gibson in many ways, um, it was kind of like a masterclass in a film that really didn't need any dialogue and you still could have watched it. I just remember kind of just being stuck, you know, watching this and um, faith wise, it was something that, that back then and now that I had always felt like was left out of like the Easter story or Easter narrative. Mm -hmm. Um, because I feel like Christians, like we like baby Jesus, um, and we like risen Jesus on Easter, but the, the, the real story of the human Jesus and, and what he had to go through in that, um, was something that impacted me really deeply on a spiritual level. When I watched it the first time, and it's, it's, it's a hard movie to watch. Like it's, it's not a fun Friday night movie mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that you want to sit no, through. No, not at all. I, I think this was the first time in about 10 years I had seen it. Um, uh, when I watched it for, uh, this episode and you, you mentioned it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the fact that, you know, it almost didn't need dialogue because the original intention on Gibson's part when hmm. it was first announced was that it would be in Latin and Aramaic, but he wouldn't yeah. include subtitles. Mm. And that was, yeah. and then he eventually changed that and decided to go ahead and add subtitles to it. I've actually seen it without subtitles because I was always curious about that. Because oh, interesting. Gibson is somebody who Mel Gibson. I mean, there's there's a lot to say about him away from the camera. There's a oh, lot oh, yes. you can to say about him, and a lot of is complicated the uh, the discussion on this film especially with uh things that have happened in his life in the past 12 years but yeah. i have always felt like gibson was an underrated actor i think as far as the 80s action stars that came out of the 80s i think he was probably the best actor of them yeah. um yeah. and he's a really good director braveheart is still one of my very favorite movies of all time my too uh, but yeah, watching, so I did get to watch it with subtitles and I decided I wanted to because I was always fascinated by that idea that he was mm -hmm. intended, he intended to make it without subtitles. And it helps that, and like you said, it almost doesn't need dialogue because yeah. you understand Gibson is such a visual, strong visual filmmaker and the work that he and cinematographer Caleb Dachanel do in the film is just tremendous as far oh, as yeah. putting you in the moment of this story. And it really does work without subtitles. This time, when when I watched it for this podcast, I did watch it with subtitles. But I think I've watched it a couple of times without, and it holds up well. Mm -hmm. It helps that it's arguably the most famous story in human history. It, sure. it definitely helps that. If you were talking about if he had tried to do this with Apocalypto, which was his next film, it yeah. wouldn't have necessarily worked. But yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but with this, where it's like, even if you're not specifically religious, you kind of understand what you kind of understand the story in general. Mm -hmm. You know, you can follow this story without dialogue and without the subtitles. Um, yeah, as as a like in my former life being a film school dropout, um, you know, I and I'm gonna butcher this, and I'll probably butcher many things on this show because again, you and I grew up in the same school system, and somehow I was never hooked <laughs> on phonics. Um, and it, you know, but it was I remember a term like that we would have like uh, was mise en scène, you know, the idea without sound. Yes. And and you know, I think that like I remember having to make films like way, 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 way back in the day that were all, all horrible. Um, but, uh, but the idea I remember teachers trying to get into our nature was, you know, you should be able to make a film without sound before you make a film with sound mm -hmm. uh, and, and exactly what you're displaying. And I, actually, I wish I would have done that <laughs> when I rewatched it to watch <laughs> without subtitles. Cause that, that's a brilliant idea, but that, that's what struck me about how just visceral it is mm -hmm. and, and how the, the dialogue is just, uh, extraneous in many ways. I mean, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think you're, you're right on. Yeah. Uh, I will say, um, I, I wouldn't want without sound entirely. I wouldn't necessarily, no, 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 because no, yeah. John Debney's score the for this movie is, is beautiful. It, it is. is it absolutely is. beautiful. It definitely borrows from Peter Gabriel's score on Last Temptation of Christ, mm -hmm. but it has, it's, it definitely has its own identity. 
It's not just, oh, I'm going to just, you know, I'm just going to do Peter Gabriel with scorer's mind. No, it's not <laughs> what he does. He's he's a talented composer. He did a really great job with the score. It was probably one of my favorite scores of the year that year. Mm-hmm. Um, Which is crazy because that's the guy that, like, did Sequest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, he He's definitely... This yeah. is definitely this is definitely an outlier to a lot of his other work. Like yeah. you you see him on a lot of you know, you you see him occasionally on like some dramas, some seri- some light comedies and stuff like that. He's kind of a chameleon and most of his movies yeah. most of his scores are not particularly memorable, but this one <laughs> is and he really uh he he really did bring he really did come to play for uh Passion of the Christ. He did a terrific job with the film. No, I'm I'm with you there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was. Yeah. Um, so when did you did you watch it? Uh, opening weekend when when? It oh, came that's out? a good that's a good question. Like uh, especially with with my faith and, and working around like ministry for many years in the past, it was one of those things. Is is I, I don't like to be a joiner. Um, <laughs> I, I I would kind of rather be like they. The, uh, the outsider a little bit on stuff. And so I think at first um, I knew, and, and for me, I knew churches and pastors that were like, we will have our whole congregation buy out the cinema. Oh yeah. For this. Yeah. But before, which is, which in my mind is, it's a bit of a risk too, yeah. because you don't, you don't know. It wasn't like they were pre-screening this. Um, I think, I think I waited a week or so. I think I waited a week or so because I didn't want to be with mm-hmm. those overly re- religious crowds sitting in there. Okay. Um, uh, I kind of wanted just to go, and I, I remember going. I went in the middle of the day, mm. on on a weekday, uh, because I kind of I didn't want to be distracted by all of that. I actually wanted to kind of experience it. Yeah. And and the first thing I, I recall, which is funny, and this is the only way that unless you can make this connection, the only way I can I connect this to to Terminator Two, um, <laughs> was I remember like when I was in high school going and watching Terminator Two. And and having a mom bring their five year old child in the theater oh. uh, to watch T two, which which again only lasted about like six minutes before the kids screaming and crying. Right, right. <laughs> and and then I remember sitting with the Passion of the Christ and seeing parents bringing in small children. As being a father as myself, you know, yeah. even a father back then, I was I, I knew enough mm-hmm. about what was going to happen. Yeah. And I was just going like, oh, this isn't going to end well. No, no. <laughs> um, like, you are going to scar this child so bad. Uh, because, again, like, even for adults, like, the movie's quite, like, viscerally scarring mm-hmm. um, yeah. as you watch it. But, I, you know, I was able to kind of push past my own, like, at the beginning, just going like, oh, my gosh, how long is this kid going to last? <laughs> um, and... Uh, no, but but I do. Yeah, I, I remember, and I remember it like just hitting me on very very deep levels mm-hmm. because I, I had for the longest time I was kind of like growing tired of the sanitized Christianity version of Jesus and being able to see this kind of blood and guts version of it. Yeah, uh, which for me may have been different for other people because for me I, I you know I was more just I was so tired of just everything being like everything coming up roses and Christian stories and mm-hmm. and being able to watch the brutality of this. Yeah, uh, was something that, at least for me, kind of made me more connected to uh, potentially, you know, the 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 area of humanity of Jesus, where you're able to see this, where there's not like this divine like get out of jail free card, right? But 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 you're seeing something that is just very gritty and dirty and human, which is part of like the gospel story that I think gets lost these days. Yeah. Well, yeah, and uh, well, when you you mentioned the idea of churches uh, running out theaters, buying out theaters for the film, I mean that's standard practice now. And I mean, we can go ahead and get into it. That Passion of the Christ <laughs> basically changed the way that studios and filmmakers catered to the faithful when it comes oh, yeah. to film. This was the first one. I, I mean, you know, you would, you would had, you had had some faith based films, and we didn't talk, we didn't necessarily talk about these early on your ups, your show. Uh, you know, I remember when the Omega Code came out. It was, <laughs> a, it was, it's a cheesy movie, but it was a hit with, you know, yeah. evangelicals. It was one of the first indications that, well, there's an audience here that you know may not, may become a 
thing. And then you had the Left Behind movies with yeah. Kirk Cameron and all that stuff. And they took a different path with uh, with how to get the <laughs> word out about the film. And then here comes Gibson. And it's funny because of the fact that like Gibson is not evangelical. He is not no, 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 no. Christian. He's a <laughs> flat out hardcore conservative Roman Catholic. No, he's he's actually he's actually like super Catholic. Yeah, like it's, he's all he's all right Catholic, which is yeah. I I, I was it, it is and again my hooked on phonics doesn't work here, but it, he's a uh, sede vacant uh, gosh uh, vacantism Catholic, which means like they are like. They don't believe in like Vatican II. They don't yeah. believe in all yeah. of this. They're like, let's get back to when it was really fun to be Catholic, um, kind of a Catholic. Oh yeah, and yeah. So well, he, and he, yeah, he and his father is the same yeah. way. You cannot talk about Mel Gibson and his faith without talking about his father Hutton Gibson. His father's a nutter butter. Yeah, um, and, like he's uh, a he's a Holocaust. <laughs> his dad is a Holocaust denier. Yeah, and I mean that was. And I mean, we could we we can we can touch on the huge controversy other than the violence with uh, mm. this movie when it comes to the debate as to whether it's in fact truly anti-Semitic or not. Um, I have my own thoughts on it. I'm sure you have your own thoughts as well. Um, but mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, it's like yeah, going back to the way this was marketed, it's like it it's this is such an outlier when it comes to Christian cinema, because it's easily the highest grossing religious movie that ever made. Is, isn't it like the highest grossing rated R movie ever? Or it was for a period of time. I don't know that it is anymore. It might still be. It might still be. In fact, you, I think you are right about that. Cause I don't, although I want to say something overtook it recently, but oh, I can't wait, remember. Wait. I think it may be, is it Deadpool? Um, I don't know, which would be hilarious. Actually, no, 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 Deadpool, not quite. Uh, not quite. Okay. I just looked this up as we we're talking. So, Passion of the Christ, at least uh, domestic gross, three hundred and seventy million dollars. Yes. Deadpool, three hundred and sixty-three. Which I'm pretty oh, sure Deadpool word. would have something to say about that. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> that's totally different show. Totally different show. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but um, uh, and it's it's also one of the highest grossing, if not the highest grossing, independent film ever made. But yeah. the yeah. way that Gibson Gibson actually like he he approached marketing this and selling the film to churches and evangelical churches, especially much in the same way that we see faith-based filmmakers like a film, a firm films and Sherwood pictures and pure flicks doing now yes. where yes. they have these advanced screenings. Like he, I think he was doing, he was doing screenings at churches, I think. Yeah. And uh, to get the word out and basically like people, yeah, I mean, group sales were a huge part of this film's success was the fact that it's like churches were buying out theaters and stuff yeah. like that. And uh, I mean, a lot of it's so fascinating, the fact that it's like you have a, like you said, sort of an alt-right Roman Catholic who is able to cater this this really shockingly violent film about the last hours of Jesus to the evangelical to evangelical Christianity who if you look at their films as we discussed on your episode your show <laughs> are very safe are very yeah. safe are very sanitized and so or, or, wait for, for a word I can use on your show that I can't use on mine yeah uh, also very much shit uh, <laughs> if we can do that you know <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> let's not let's let's not beat around the bush on that one. Or just absolute shit. No, exactly. But, um, uh, no, but I think what you're saying, like I think, since the passion, the passion is kind of one of those weird outliers. Yes. Uh, you know, it was it was kind of the top of what can happen, and we've been like on a on a free fall ever since then. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? For if if you class it, see, I in many ways it's Christian cinema, but in many ways it's really not. Yes. Uh, and. And with the passion, I feel like what what distinguishes it, besides the violence, besides the fact that there was a quality director behind it, mm -hmm. which is no small two things I pushed aside here, but <laughs> you know, overall, what I would say is the biggest thing about this was was risk. Mm -hmm. And you know, Gibson ponies up his own money. Yes. And and ultimately, really doesn't care 
on some level, how successful it is. He just wanted to make a quality film because that it was his passion. Yes. Uh, not trying to have a pun there, but I feel like with when you get to other Christian films, I feel like they are trying to minimize absolute risk, uh, mm. which, which which is a good recipe for bad cinema every time. Um, no, that's it, absolutely right. And the fact of the matter is, yes, it was. It was, and I mean, yes, it sounds like a pun to call this a passion project for Gibson, but really isn't because he had had this on the brain for a while. It wasn't until after he had some of the biggest successes of his career as an actor, they decide I'm going to do this. And he had the clout to do it independently of the studios. And he basically said, okay, studios come at me. Who are you? Who's going to distribute this for me? It's like, we've got the infrastructure already in place. And uh, yeah, it was, so it was just this, it was, it was a risk for him and it was, it was something that he, he loved doing and it was something that meant something to him. And yeah, yeah, if you had, if you had this type of passion toward with pretty much any other like real, like faith-based film, you would be seeing a much different industry. Even if you oh, absolutely. Don't, even if you don't go as extreme with the R rating as Gibson does, sure, it would see it would be there wouldn't be this gulf between Hollywood making a religious movie or religiously themed movie like your Last Temptation of Christ or your Silence or Dogma and yeah. stuff like that or Noah, and you wouldn't have this gulf between them in terms of quality. I think you would have a much, you would have a closer, they would be closer in quality. And well, it would but, be a win-win, I think, for everybody. But the, but the thing you'd mentioned, when you mentioned, like, you mentioned Scorsese, and you mentioned, like, Aronofsky, uh, it's not just passion, it's also talent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which, you know, it's, it's both of those together. I think there's plenty of people out there that have a passion but have no talent. Yeah. And, and that is Christian cinema, you know, in, <laughs> in a nutshell. Like, they have this, like, shallow passion, um, and they're doing it in a safe economical standpoint, mm-hmm. but they don't have the talent um, yeah. to do that. Whereas Mel Gibson, at least, you know, for whatever people feel about him, he had, he had really honed his chops um, in many other areas. Yeah. Uh, before stepping into this. And and I think that it, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's both. It's mm-hmm. both at the same time having that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we, we can, and you know, we, we talked about over uh, messenger that, I mean, there were other films that Hollywood tried to sort of co-op this, uh, oh, yes. this for, we <laughs> talked about Christian uh, Chronicles of Narnia Lion, the Witch, yeah. and the Wardrobe, which is fantasy, and so it's sure. like you had you had it, you had them sort of drafting off of the religious audience that they saw with Passion of the Christ, but also catering to Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and stuff like that mm-hmm. because it's a fantasy film. And then you had and you brought up, and I completely forgot about it. Yes, Evan Almighty, yes. which is the other. Noah's Ark movie that Hollywood has made, not nearly as successfully, I think, as Aronofsky's is. But I forgot about the fact that <laughs> those are two totally yeah, no, you're totally no, right you, about that. No, you yeah, you can't. No, it, they're uh, two completely oh, yeah. different. And I love, I love Steve Carell, which yeah. is funny. If you want to do the, the the John Denby connection, he did Bruce Almighty, and yeah. uh, as as a closer, and then we get to Evan Almighty, uh, and I would have rather had Brick from Anchorman. As Noah, yeah. Then we, <laughs> see, that 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 would have made some money somehow. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, but you're right about that. I I remember, I I used to. This is years ago. Would go to this. It was uh, and it was in Atlanta. Um, well, at the beginning it was in Atlanta. Now it's on two coasts. They would have this. It, it was a it was a uh, a concert, not a concert, <laughs> a conference um, for pastors, mm-hmm. uh, pastors and like Christians called Catalyst. Um, if you're in Atlanta, you know about Andy Stanley. Uh, North Point Church, which is a big deal over there. Yeah, and I remember them uh, them pushing that hard on all of us in that realm, pastors, 
about, they had a whole session about how this movie is going to be great, how it's going to be able to, to market for your flock and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm watching this and I, I watched the preview and I'm going like, really? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Like, it, it, it made no sense, but it was, you know, as much as we trash uh, Christians for using this, like using the passion as some sort of a, of a model to how to market, yeah, uh, would try the same thing, and I don't think I I I, I couldn't tell you how much Evan Al or uh, Evan Almighty made, it but it was do one that of those. Well. But the fact of the matter is, it's like it was that's such a, and I I think part of the reason that I I forgot about was because of the fact that it was it's such an like it's such a bizarre choice because mm-hmm. it's only tangentially religiously themed i mean it is but like nobody would necessarily put in the same realm as you would put aronofsky's noah or dogma or even even like dogma or yes. life of brian or something like that where it's like it's it there's definitely something more going on and it's like really a broad huge budgeted steve carell movie where he basically yeah. plays noah it's like I yeah when you when you mentioned that when we were going back and forth about it, I completely forgot about that it's like oh wow yeah I, yeah I, for me <laughs> for me being because I'm I'm always very sensitive especially with me, when I'm being marketed to because it's like it's easy to sniff out yeah uh, and I was just like huh huh <laughs> like why is this ha- like this might as well have been like the Veggie Tales movie if you're also talking about bad Christian cinema yeah um, you know <laughs> it was it was almost like that dumb that they were doing that, but I knew churches that were handing out flyers, like, oh, we need to go support this. We need to go be, and I'm just like, like, what? Like, and, and, and that, I think that's one of the bizarre factors of how, uh, evangelical Christianity has like bisected, um, with film is the fact that somehow, like, if you don't go and support these things, like our faith will die, which, which, (laughs) <laughs> like it, which is like the saddest, limpest version of like marketing and faith at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, I never understood that. Like, oh, so if we're not making money for these studios, our faith is in balance. <laughs> well, and and you know, it's like we we talked we talked on your show about the uh, double edged sort of you know filmmaking as commerce versus filmmaking as message. I mean, you know, you know, you you would. Let's let's be honest. Hollywood catering Evan Almighty to evangelical Christians because of a tangential uh, thematic connection to uh, faith is really like that's about as cynical as you can get. And it's like when yeah. Hollywood does it, it definitely does feel cynical when oh, yeah. when they do oh, yeah. something like that. And mm-hmm. uh, no, and and it it definitely. You know, and to a certain extent, you could say the same thing about *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*. I mean, you know, yeah. you have C.S. Lewis who wrote *Chronicles of Narnia*, so it's like okay, but it's still. And you have Aslan as like the ultimate. It's, uh, yeah, it's a Jesus figure. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and 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 safe enough because most Christian, they, yeah, because they were doing that as kind of sort of thing where people sometimes when they mention C.S. Lewis, he's safe enough. Um, for the non-Christian crowd, but the Christians are just kind of like, they get their own kind of like <clears throat> ideological hard on when they hear about that. They're like, oh, it's a C.S. Lewis movie. Oh, it's being marketed by Hollywood. Do tell me more. <laughs> um, and for me, I watched it and I, I've, I've read, all, I've read all the books to my kids. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they're great fantasy books. Yeah. The movie, I would say not so much. Um, yeah. It, 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 it felt like Lord of the Rings light. It mm-hmm. felt very cheap and like rushed through um no it definitely it was yeah that yeah. that first one definitely did uh mm-hmm. yeah you're you're not wrong there and i i think like prince caspian and uh, voyage of the dawn treader were actually better when they yeah. adapted those books i i thought those films were actually better um, um i i they, i felt they like were some of the i thought like they had less of an audience too it was somehow like they were still making them and they didn't care as much. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they made a little bit of a better, like it, it had more time to gel as a film. Mm-hmm. Um, it reminded me of, and this is probably a bad example, but like when they made, um, oh gosh, um, the series of unfortunate events. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which again is books. Like we read to our kids 
they were like, hey, let's squish three books into one movie. Um, it, and, and also featuring Jim Carrey. Um, and, and it was a terrible movie. Mm-hmm. But it's because I think it was, it was pushing too much too fast. And it was, I, I don't know. Yeah, again, I could rip on other Hollywood movies that were, I feel like you didn't have enough time to incubate. Yeah. Um, the process like Justice League or other things of that nature <laughs> were, you, you end up having a release date and that matters more than the actual movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> different, different show, my friend. Sorry, I'll keep no, off no, my tangents. Fine. No, that's fine. And yeah, I mean, we're we're. It's funny. We're we're we we've done a lot of talking. We haven't really touched on. <laughs> we we've we've sort of gotten <laughs> off topic. There. But I mean, the fact yeah. that there is you and I both are doing it. It's not just you. It's both of us. Believe me. And but the fact that there is, it's like these are these are topics that were a big part of. Gibson's film and there are big things that happened after Gibson's film and it's like it's there's so much about this there's so much about what Mel's film Mel Gibson's film did that completely it does set it did set the template for things Mm -hmm. that Hollywood did as well as things that evangelical uh, faith-based studios did too after the fact so I mean, it's, yeah, it's not really to doing with a specific film, but it's still doing with things that came out of the film. And that's ultimately, that's ultimately why it's important to bring it up. Well, and, and you, you brought, you brought up something interesting too. Um, and getting, I, I guess I'll try, I'll try to edge my brain back towards the passion, but, um, you know, nowadays, I think if you, if you would make the passion, which again, Mel's making a sequel to it. Yes. Uh, uh <laughs> I don't, I don't think the marketing will be the same because in many ways, like, which was surprising about the passion was the fact that generally the evangelical crowd does not get along with the Catholic crowd. Yes. Uh, but the one thing they could at least agree on was this idea of Jesus. You know, mm-hmm. we may not get into uh, the particulars of our theology, but at least we all agree that Jesus died. So, <laughs> you know, that, that's like our one talking point. Which, again, I was listening to Mel talk about the sequel on Colbert, and he's delving a little bit further into the, uh, the Catholic interpretation of like, what happened when Jesus was in, uh, when he was dead for three days. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm like, you're going to lose some evangelicals on this, because they yeah. don't like straying from the narrative. Like, like you'd mentioned Noah, you know, this idea of using imagination— yeah. Uh, where the Bible doesn't explicitly say it, but there's gaps in the story in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'll, I, I will I will watch it. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to be lined up at the theater to watch it, but um, it'll be definitely something I'll be just curious to see creatively. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely happening. fascinated by that. It's like the yeah when and I remember him mentioning it. I think a couple of years ago, or it might have been closer to around the time that Hacksaw Ridge came out. Mm-hmm. That is when I first when I first heard about, but yeah, it, he he finally announced it, and Jim Caviezel was going to be in it. It's funny that Jim Caviezel was going to be in that because I mean I would imagine part of the I would imagine part of the story in the Resurrection, which is the working title of uh, the sequel, is going to have to do, is going to do with Paul, and it's funny yeah. because. A There's another Paul Jones movie too. Has yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, a Paul Apostle of Christ movie coming out with Jim Caviezel as Paul, mm-hmm. and it's like okay, so is he basically just going to play every major figure in the New Testament, or I, is honestly, it just... I think we, need, I think Aronofsky needs to do Noah again with Jim Caviezel. Like screw <laughs> Russell, bro. Like everybody, like in this new movie, like we need to have Jim Caviezel as like every character in the Bible now. <laughs> Because <laughs> sadly, he's he's off TV now, and I, and I don't. And again, I have nothing against Caviezel. Yeah, uh, he's, uh, tremendous I, you know, in, in, he's tremendous. He's tremendous. He's good. Like of Christ, he was absolutely he's, he's, amazing. He's tremendous. I, I think actually, the, talking about the movie, like the things that that I thought his acting was the best when they would have the flashback scenes. Yeah, because you were able to see more. Um, yeah. and I, I was like, show me more of that, as mm-hmm. opposed to him just responding to having the the literal shit kicked out of him. Um. Which again, he does well with that too. Um, yeah, he, but he does a great job of looking like this hurts, this sucks, this is bad. I don't like this. Um, please stop. Mm-hmm. But um, 
but again, like there were those moments, those brief like vignettes when I was like, oh my gosh, like there's something here. And again, G- Gibson has a great eye for that. Yeah. Um, and even hearkening back, I remember I I remember a church that I was uh, that I had kind of was going to begin working for, where they actually uh, rented out like several. Um, it's funny you make me remember this. Had rented out several screenings of The Passion, and since Jim Caviezel. Um, was from Mount Vernon, Washington. Mm-hmm. They they found his dad and had his dad come and speak about the film. It was not in the movie at all, but it was like <laughs> it, it's you know it's like the dad of Jesus. So you might yeah. it's like God baby here. So <laughs> come listen to this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just kind of like that's a little weird in my head. Like you know I'm sure his dad's a swell guy. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. But again. Do we all remember Jim Caviezel is an actor? He's not really Jesus. Um, <laughs> and with evangelicals, I don't know. I don't know if they yeah. knew the difference. Yeah. Um, no, I but, mean, but, I, you're, you're absolutely right but, when you talk about uh, Caviezel. Definitely, I mean, obviously his best material, the material that he's given to humanize uh, mm-hmm. Jesus in the film is obviously the flashbacks. It's There's not really a lot of there's not really a lot of range he's playing uh, from the moment we see him in Gethsemane till the very end. There's not a lot of range in that, that period of time. And yeah, the flashbacks are a big part of that. And I had forgotten, I'd forgotten how judiciously he uh, Gibson uses those in the film. And I'd forgotten there were some that I remembered. I mean, I remembered him making the table and with his mother. I'd remember the Sermon on the mm-hmm. Mount. Um, I'd forgotten about exactly where they were placed in the context of the 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 passion and yeah. uh, the passion narrative. And the thing, and I liken that. I actually with, I actually just rewatched a. Uh, filmmaker who's a who's a huge uh who who's had a huge impact on my life over the years for a previous podcast this year uh andre sarkovsky the russian Mm -hmm. filmmaker uh he only made seven features but his his movies if if you're a person of faith and not that tarkovsky's work is specifically religious but it's deeply spiritual and i think people of faith if they're willing to take that leap with Tarkovsky. And he mm-hmm. is a leap. I say this as somebody who's a great fan of his. I know his films are difficult to watch. Uh, he He's somebody who I think people of faith would actually appreciate. And um, he he did this thing in his films, which, which basically are called, he called poetic linkages, which are basically mm. scenes that, don't necessarily have anything to do with the streamlined narrative of the film, but create an emotional connection to a specific moment in the film. And I feel mm. like with the scenes of, with the flashbacks that Gibson uses in Passion, I feel like he's doing the exact same thing. It's mm. not necessarily presenting context to what it's, it's, to a certain extent, it's presenting context and it's presenting a humanizing factor for Jesus and more of an understanding of why he is doing what he is doing in going through this experience. But it's it it grabs you more emotionally and it just really solidifies a more emotional uh, rationale behind what we're watching. Mm-hmm. And I, and I feel like also as a viewer, it gives you a chance to breathe. Yes. Um, you know, it's that contrast between um, the what other people have called like torture porn that kind yes. of was happening. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it gives you a, it gives you a, a relief, like that idea that you're you know you're in a storm and you're trying to catch that breath. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when the water's coming over your head, and it, at least it sustains you. Yeah. Um, through through the the whole like roller coaster that is the passion, mm-hmm. um, and and for me and I think that's that's also good storytelling when like you know I kept going like I want to see more of that, mm-hmm. um, and it's that idea that you're teasing but you're not giving me, 
uh, more of what I want. Now here's reality again. Whoosh, 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 yeah. You know. Um, well, and it's funny we've you know, and we've both touched on how um, horrifically violent the passion is, mm -hmm. um, and it's famously it's famously violent. The mm -hmm. funny thing that occurred to me when I was watching it, like right when the scourging was about to begin, I uh, basically looked at the time as far as what time in the movie that that mm. happens. It's minute 52. Yeah. It, before that, we haven't, while yes, there's been violence and uh, bullying of Jesus from the guards the heavy stuff happens at starts the really brutally yeah. violent stuff happens at the starts at the scourging. Yeah. And it basically goes on for like the remainder of the film. Yeah. The film's not yeah. even the film's barely two hours. It's yeah. not that long of a movie. Mm -hmm. And so it's really it's kind of striking to me the fact that it's like it has this it has this reputation, well deserved of being very violent, but that mm -hmm. violence is really only contained within a span of a little over an hour. Yeah. And it's no, really that, interesting that, to me. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, and what's interesting, and, and not to completely circle back into the whole like marketing part of it, but it made me think about that with um, the odd combination of, of uh, Mel's like alt Catholic, Catholic views and, and evangelicals was because this is, the way they're dis displaying this movie story-wise, it's less about the Gospels that, that you would read, like the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Gospels, and it's more about like the Catholic Stations of the Cross. Yes. Uh, it's, yes. Like, it, it's like you're checking a box, like this happens, this mm -hmm. happens, this happens. And so, um, you know, I didn't watch it through Catholic eyes, mm -hmm. um, but I have friends that have, and it was kind of like, for them, it was like, which again is, you know, we're talking about being in the season of Lent, and as you move towards Easter, like that, that is a visceral thing for Catholics, where they, they walk through the Stations of the Cross, like mm -hmm. remembering and contemplating each of these steps, um, which aren't all necessarily like uh, biblical steps. They're more like historical um, things that have been uh, added um, over the years. And, and Gibson is very faithful Catholic in doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's, he's like, you know, crossing, <laughs> crossing his T's and dotting his I's as he moves through all of that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and you're right. Like when you're saying, like mid midway where the scourging happens, and then the walk to the cross, and you know, it's there's all these beats that that are that are happening that are not just cinematic. They're also uh, like religious tradition beats mm -hmm. moving yeah. through that. Yeah, and and when you, I mean, I don't have a Catholic background myself, but I remember when Roger Ebert reviewed the film. I mean, he 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 was a Catholic, and he he mentioned mm -hmm. the stations of the cross and his review and that, that seemed more of the, uh, that seemed more of the inspiration than the, even though, I mean, mm -hmm. Gibson said a lot at the time of being about the, you know, being based on the gospels, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, you had, you had Pope John Paul allegedly saying it is as it was, although, I mean, I know the veracity of that quote, not necessarily, uh, you know, that that's been disputed as to whether he mm -hmm. actually did say that about the movie. But yeah, I mean, it, it does. And I think that structure, I, I think that structure is important. I think it helps to, because it feels like, it feels like this, the movie is going somewhere and that's yeah. the narrative. And that's because mm -hmm. if you felt like it was just, torture porn which i mean it's it was weird that passion came out i mean it came out before saw but it came out the same year as saw <laughs> and so the fact that like you had this this you had later in the year you basically had the debut of basically the ultimate torture porn franchise yeah, yeah. in addition to this um this story, the way that Gibson is telling this story, and the fact of the matter is, it's like, look, Gibson is Braveheart is pretty violent itself. Sure. So, I mean, you you kind of knew you were going to get that when it came to Gibson, uh, mm -hmm. when he made the Passion. But yeah, so the fact that you have that, um, if it were just a matter of nonstop, you know, violence, I I think. 
that would have been harder to take. And oh, yeah. you feel like there is a purpose to it. Even if you don't necessarily, even if you don't share Gibson's uh, religious views and his his religion, you still feel like there he's he's doing while he's obviously doing this for him it's definitely a passionate project for him sure it's also something he's not forgetting the audience either Mm -hmm. and he's he's not forgetting the fact that it's like most people who watch this are not going to be sharing his faith Mm -hmm. well and 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 on one thing that i that in, in the midst of what you're saying here that i actually did appreciate um from some of that um, was the fact that this is something, um, you know, and people can argue whether, you know, the veracity of Jesus being real or not, and that, that's a whole different debate. Yeah. Um, you know, with, but, um, but these were common things that Romans did to torture people. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, the crucifixions were real. The scourging was real. Um, you know, the way that, that, that the, I guess the Roman government operated, this was real. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we talked about previously, but so in, in a certain sense, there is there is an amount of realism. And I know, you know, many people and I use the term because I, I I remember people back in the time calling it torture porn. Um, but these were real things that happened. Yeah. You know, th- th- you know, this kind of torture was a real part of history. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this wasn't like saw where you're making it up. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, no, <laughs> like, no. And, how can we be I'm, sadistic? I'm, and my, um, my, my and, goal was to not. I no, I'm, agree- I don't I'm actually agreeing with you. Either, um, so. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm actually agreeing with you. Just me, just kind of just drawing deeper on that, that, that historically speaking, this, you know, these kind of things did happen and they are disgusting and horrific. Um, and it is, it, it is a crazy thing that we can think that that was okay to humans um, uh, during that time period, even though I guess we're not getting too political that, you know, yeah. it's fine for AR 15s to still be legal, but that's a totally different story. <laughs> different show but uh i'll leave it at that um yeah and and the thing is it's i i think there's there's nothing subtle about what gibson is doing in this film (laughs) i mean needless to say the violence is what everybody thinks about but from a filmmaking standpoint there's nothing subtle about either i mean braveheart established the fact that he understands he knows how to use slow motion he understands the power (laughs) of slow motion I will say I do feel like watching it again, I feel like he uses it too much, especially in the opening in Gethsemane, at the Garden oh, of Gethsemane. Yeah. yeah. Like it it dulls the intent of what you're supposed to be using slow motion for mm-hmm. with how much he uses it there. Now later on he starts to be a little bit more judicious with it mm-hmm. and it has that impact. It's still yeah. kind of numbing. I mean, part yeah. of that is because of the violence too, and what it's emphasizing in terms of the violence as well. And uh, the, the the one part I I would disagree with Gibson on, which I thought it, it's kind of slow motion and it's kind of CGI. Yeah, and you may you may see where I'm going with this one. Like my one moment that I felt it like he stepped into cheese. Um, do you know what I'm going to say? Uh, Maybe, the, but the, I'm not quite sure. The uh the the teardrop raindrop. Oh God, yes, yeah, that is where end. I thought you were gonna go. No, oh, okay, okay. Because <laughs> I watched this and go like, ah, uh, like, like you, it was fairly good here, but then bad, weird CGI moments in you know, yeah, whether it's rain or whether it's God crying. Yeah. Um, no, the, I was just I was like, ah. Well, just the ending yeah. in general. It's not. I mean, the teardrop, obviously, yes, that is ridiculously over the top. The the way he shoots the destruction of the temple that okay that works, but there's also there's also this moment where Satan has been a physical pres- presence throughout the yeah. film. I mean mm-hmm. that's that's one of the that's one of the way places in which Gibson, if if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the places where Gibson devi- deviates from the gospel writing. Of this, yeah, stuff. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a, it's an interesting touch. It's definitely, I think it's most effective in Gethsemane at the beginning. Yeah, I would agree um, with that. But yeah, we're going to the going back to the ending. The there isn't there a scene where there is a scene where like 
it's basically the classic no, uh, like <laughs> no ridiculously over the top thing of no at the yeah, yeah. end with Satan, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah. lord, that yeah. just doesn't work. No, the ending of that movie is just it, very... it, it ends up being like the end of a Bond movie. Yeah, you know, it's... like where you have to have this over the top like uh, there's been this huge fight. Or I'm even thinking of like, oh god, a stupid film, Goldeneye, where like yeah. we yeah. the dude's already like fallen off of something, mm -hmm. but we have to have this large thing fall on top of him and smash him to really make sure he's dead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's that old, but I don't know if some of that's the action movie in Gibson. Uh, you know what I mean, like the '80s action movie where you have to have I'm this. Sure, over I'm the sure top. there's a little bit of that. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's a little bit of that as far as. Um... It, you know, it, it that, might have only been better if Jesus would have like had some sort of a bad catchphrase as it happened. Um, at the you know like how like all the eighty movies you know uh, <laughs> we're we're and, we're we're talking about making a completely different movie here now and yeah. Grant I'm but kind of interested. I, I may watch this movie. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> I'm totally joking. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, and the, yeah, because I actually the movie felt like he didn't know how to end it. Yeah. I think I think the way and the thing is I feel like if if he had ended it with Jesus dying, Jesus expiring, mm -hmm. and then you have the destruction of the temple, and then you mm -hmm. go to what is a really lovely shot at the end where you basically imply the resurrection. Mm -hmm. I feel like that would have been the way to do it without the over the the top parts of it. Yeah, I feel like that. Though I feel like you could have, he's certainly a talented enough filmmaker to where I feel like he could have made that work. Mm -hmm. And yeah, without the over the top aspects of it, like the teardrop, like Satan, you know, mm -hmm. in his defeat and stuff like that. I, I feel like he, he just, uh, yeah, he, like you said, to a certain extent, he doesn't really know how to end it. And, uh huh. He, he was so enamored with everything that came before that, yeah, he, he sort of it, loses the ending a little bit. But I feel like he does make up for it with the the last shot we see of the resurrected Jesus. And, and I'll ruin that last shot for you in a second. Um, uh, not, not really meaning to. No, but it did. Like, on, on one level, it, it the ending felt like, if you've ever watched movies that you know, like in Hollywood, that they have gone and test marketed. And and people are like, yeah, I liked it, but not the ending. So they kind of reshoot it or recut oh, yeah. it together. Yeah. It, 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 in a certain sense, it kind of felt like that. I felt like it was it was like a juggernaut um, of 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 vision and uh, and cinematography. And then it kind of just felt like, oh, we're done. Um, and and that that to me that that just felt weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. I felt like we we spent so much time in Act One and Act Two, and Act Three is like thirty seconds long. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it just has like a happy ending. Um, and, and I, I know, I, you know, I, I get, I get, I get what he was going for, but it, it yeah. just, it felt like he had spent so much time on this, this dark, uh, you know, gritty, gritty feeling. Mm -hmm. It almost felt too nice yeah. to end it. And, and my only question when I was watching this, and it's just because I'm a total asshole, um, as I'm watching the last shot, um, I'm watching this and I'm going like, Jim Caviezel is a great actor because I have no idea how I'm not watching his balls as he walks across because they have they, they have like you know half of the Lord's ass walking across here you know yeah. like it's like a side shot and I'm going like and I don't even know why I thought about that but I was like okay Jesus naked I don't remember that part but he's naked uh, but he's tucking or something like how is he doing that uh, and that's just me being dumb and snarky with that but um but it was like I, I felt like the resolution. And, and I guess in his mind, we all know the resolution. The resolution yes. is in your hearts. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but like for me, I, it would have been interesting to have sat down with somebody that had no context, mm -hmm. you know, for any of the story. Because, yeah. you know, if you if you look at it, it made way more money domestically than it did uh, on the foreign yeah. uh, budget wise. And and I would just be curious how folks, you know, that that are not familiar, that don't, you know, aren't from America, that know everything about Jesus and or Americanized Jesus and everything else like that. I, I you know, I, I would be curious how like on a visceral level, would that affect people? Would people be like, what the hell is going on here? What is this? <laughs> you know, because, because most of the movie operates under this idea, which is, which makes it different than others that, that you're stepping into this already knowing the story. Yes. 
So and I and for me, I'm not sure. Like the question I kind of had is, is that sloppy filmmaking? Um, uh, in a certain sense, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, and and I don't know if that's a fair question for me to ask. Um, I don't know if it's I, a fair question for me to ask. I mean, I I think it's definitely an interesting question to ask. Uh, do I think it's nece- I don't necessarily feel like. I don't necessarily feel like it's sloppy filmmaking on Gibson's part. I think that, I mean, some of the things that we've talked about as far as like the use of slow motion and stuff like that, mm-hmm. it's like, that's why I look at it as far as sloppy filmmaking. Uh, yeah. Do I think that it definitely feels, it's definitely made from a place that you, you think your audience, uh, you hope that your audience already knows the story Mm -hmm. well enough where you because one i know one of the big criticisms of it was the fact that you didn't necessarily get a lot of context with regards to jesus's teachings and who jesus was and we'll go ahead and go into this why jesus was a threat to yeah. the oh yeah the, the Pharisees the power yeah, yeah 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 absolutely and so we'll go ahead and go into that and the one of the big uh, part of the reason it was so controversial and I think part of the reason why so many people mm. it wasn't just the uh, market it wasn't just the marketing I think part of the reason so many people were so curious and this happens with a lot of controversial films is the fact that it's like they wanted to see it for themselves because one of the things that people were really concerned about was that the movie was going to flame anti-Semitic rhetoric Mm -hmm. because of the way that the Pharisees are um, portrayed and the, the contrast between the way the Pharisees are portrayed in the movie versus the way that Pontius Pilate is portrayed in Mm -hmm. the film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we've talked about how Gibson and his father <laughs> come from yeah. the alt-right version of Catholicism, and his father is famously, uh, is a famous Holocaust denier. Um, and certainly there have been, there have been incidents, some well-documented, some not quite as well-documented in Gibson's career since Passion of the Christ that have sort of conflated the idea that he is in fact anti-semitic as well mm-hmm. uh you have the 2006 doi with him uh yeah and then there was he was working on a movie about the uh maccabees rebellion yep yep yep, yep. uh with paul Esteros, which that was an interesting <laughs> combination right there <laughs> uh, yes. and Esteros supposedly wrote this letter to Gibson basically and basically calling him out for being anti-Semitic as well. Mm-hmm. And uh so it it goes into the question of my personal feeling on the film is I you you watch this film, you I feel like you kind of understand the fact that the Pharisees in the film are not necessarily speaking for all Jews. True. I don't feel like that's the case. I don't feel like you get any sense of that being the case. I know that Gibson uh, had shot and at one point subtitled the uh, infamous dialogue, his blood be on us and our children Mm -hmm. from the book of Matthew, but Mm -hmm. he got rid of the subtitles and, uh, I know that was something that people used as a uh, fuel to the fire, as well as the fact that Pontius Pilate is not quite as ruthless as he is considered in terms of history. I think, I I don't feel like there's any sense of deliberate anti-Semitism in the film. If you go in feeling anti-Semitic, chances are you're going to get that from the film. That's but true. if you're not, I don't think that's something you're going to take away. I mean, I, when I went into watching Glorious Bastards, I went in feeling very anti-Semitic, and I was very upset. About, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but um, no, no, no. But like, but yeah. And I, I think, I think some of the criticisms that are happening, um, 
in in a certain sense, uh, are more historic. Um, yeah, especially when you speak about the Catholic Church on on a, on a larger scale, mm-hmm. um, I, I think I think some of it's it's also like we've said, like if, if you know, <clears throat> for for folks that step into this and there's really not Jesus backstory, we kind of just hop in because the you know the assumed notion is you, well most people know you know a general idea of this story, yes, and, and and so you know I think you you take some of that, but at the same time I think that there also has has been um, and it's, it's, it's an ugly part of Christian history. Um, that there has been, um, anti-Semitism. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the Catholic church, um, has, has had many of those sins on their hands, um, in, in the past. Uh, and I, I, we could probably, that's a whole different historical conversation, oh, yeah. but you know, Absolutely. and even, even, even when you begin to talk about, you know, uh, historical figures like Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther was an, you know, he was anti-Semitic, um, uh, and wrote books like, you know, on the Jews and their lies, um, you know, who's like one of the fathers of Protestantism. So, you know, I think that there is, there are these like dark threads of anti-Semitism to that. And that, you know, there are ways to be able to read into, um, that, especially in this movie. But again, I, I don't know if, 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 if it was intentional, even though like what you'd mentioned earlier, Mel Gibson's had his own issues. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's hard to like pull those two things apart. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, um, some of the story, again, like, you know, when I had said earlier, like, oh, we don't have backstory on this. Like, I don't want the movie to be longer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or like if we were to spend a bunch of times learning about the Pharisees or the Sadducees or how the political system and the religious systems of the day worked. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, that's extraneous stuff. I mean, well, and it's I think, a different movie as well. Oh it my gosh. A oh my gosh. Completely different movie. Oh, sure, sure, sure. And and I think that like, you know, the thing it, again, I don't have an answer for how he would have done this because part of the passion narrative and even part of especially the Catholic passion narrative, he was hitting all he was hitting all the greatest hits. Yeah. And you know, and and you know, if it, as you read the scripture, the Jews were saying those things, but it wasn't all Jews. You know, because mm-hmm. if you think about like Palm Sunday, there were plenty of Jews that were like celebrating Jesus coming into town. Yeah. And you know, and it's so it is. It's it's a very complicated issue, especially just with us living in a world where anti-Semitism has been a big deal. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a huge sensitivity, and especially with Hollywood, there's a big sensitivity to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there may have been ways that didn't necessarily compromise the narrative um, that Gibson may, may could have been more sensitive towards certain things. Mm-hmm. Um you know, because if, if Jesus is the focal point, I don't know if completely demonizing the Jews, because the idea of, you know, uh, this isn't necessarily a Jewish thing. This is a, it's a power structure thing. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, like, you know, like reading in the theology, like, you know, the Pharisees hated him. The Sadducees hated him. It was a power thing. It wasn't like a, you're anti-Jewish or it, mm-hmm. it was it, it was all about power, which, again, Rome was all about power. You know, the yes. reason Pilate was acting the way he was acting was if you read historically speaking, Pilate didn't really care. Like his main issue was you guys handle your own mess. Um, yeah. I'm in charge of this region and I don't want to see any kind of other uprising, which again, they were afraid of something that you'd mentioned earlier, the, the Maccabees, you know, there was, there was always these uprisings, mm-hmm. um, that would happen under uh, Roman control. Um, and so they did not want that to happen again. So I think some of Pilate's like, Pilate doesn't understand it. Um, and, in a certain factor, it just doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think some of the reason he get he gets a pass in it because he's not part of that world. Um, and, and, and for us, you know, as listeners, we don't fully get the whole, well, we don't have the backstory of it. And, right. and, and to some degree it's neither here nor there mm-hmm. uh, in the midst of it. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what was in Mel Gibson's heart. I know that. Yeah. I, I just know that there are streams of Christianity that are anti-Semitic. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, especially reading into the passion story as well, um, you know, historically and potentially currently as well. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if some of that was 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 unfair or some of it was warranted. It, it's really it's really hard to. We weren't in Mel Gibson's mind, so it's it's hard to know. No, um, and 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 you're absolutely right. And I mean, ultimately, I you know, and and that's the thing. That's why I'm. That's part of why I'm of the mind that it. It's not 
specifically deliberately anti-Semitic. I never necessarily felt like it was. Again, like I said, I feel like if you bring that into, if you bring your own personal feelings of in that vein into the movie, yeah, you mm -hmm. probably will see it that way, but you won't necessarily leave thinking one way, go in thinking one way and come out thinking another. I don't think that's oh, going to yeah. happen. It's all, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it goes, and it goes back to the whole, you know, do movie, do, do movies and video games cause in, <laughs> in, per, you know, violence in, uh, in, in, in real life is, is yeah, that, yeah. and ultimately, no, like I've seen plenty of violent movies over the years. That doesn't mean I feel like the inclination to be violent. That's not yeah. who I am. And so, and I think it's the same way with this. And, you know, the way the pilot handles it, he's handling it like a politician. Yeah. You know, and he's handling it like a politician would. I mean, he, mm -hmm. the Pharisees are his constituents. And so it's like, you know, it's your thing. Do, do what your, do your thing. And, you know, this is what we're, and yeah, and, and so. that And that's the hard thing in cinema. I think that, you know, is it, is being able to read into the personal lives of people. Um, but at the same time, directors have messages. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, like, you know, if you can go back and watch every Woody Allen movie and, and assume he's a pervert, which he probably is, uh, you know, uh, a creepy old man. Cause you know, and it changes the tone of the film. Oh yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Or, or like, or Polanski as well too. I mean, you, you can, you can kind of go back and look for things. Um, mm -hmm. especially like it didn't help him that, you know, Mel Gibson, after this goes on his anti-Semitic rant. Yeah. Um, so that didn't help his case at all. Yeah. Um, you know, or you can go back to like OJ Simpson and his love for cutlery. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, it, it's, you know, it, it goes endlessly on, on that. Um, and it's hard. Yeah. Is it, is it the art? Is it the person? Is it the, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like I've seen, I've seen other films that probably would be more <laughs> anti-Semitic or more hateful. Yeah. Um, but but again, for those that felt persecuted against, I could totally see what they're saying. Oh, yeah. No, ab absolutely. And I I certainly understand why the Anti-Defamation League was concerned about it. I mean, it it, it is because, yeah, the Pharisees are very they're they're out for blood when it comes to mm -hmm. Jesus. And yes, that is that is definitely something that. If you're sensitive to if you're sensitive to that, if you're worried that this may invoke anti inflame anti Semitic thought, yeah, I can mm -hmm. understand that if if you're if you're used to being persecuted in that way. I completely yeah. get that. Um well, me, or if I you don't look necessarily at it, see that it. That Jesus but, was a Jew. <laughs> well, yeah, that yeah. that too. And the fact <laughs> of the matter is you have Simon who helps him with the cross, you have uh yeah. Uh, what was the? Uh, uh, there's uh, the woman that like gives him the towel to like wipe his face. Yeah, and I can't uh, remember her name. I thought uh, it was Veronica or something like that. It was something like that. Yeah, she's more pa part of the passion narrative than she is actually about the them in the Gospels. Yeah. Uh, but but no, you're right. I mean, and it, it's hard. It's hard with culture because one and like I on one level I can watch this as just a human narrative. Yes. Without the labels. And be like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's jerks amongst all of us. Yeah. Uh, at certain times in my life, I have been that jerk probably to people. And you know, we, we all there's we're all culpable with being uh, with being horrible at different times. But mm -hmm. again, culture, there's a sensitivity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Especially you know to, to to what yeah to what people have also been through. So it's it, it I don't it's it's a tough knot. Um, mm -hmm. to untangle um, within that, that I'm not sure that we no, totally I mean, you're, can. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the fact of the matter is, it's like, it, I, you could bring so many people into this discussion, and I mean, you, the discussion would never end because mm -hmm. of the fact that it's like, it's, it's, there is a lot of complicated aspects mm -hmm. to this discussion. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I, I feel like the, I, I look at the movie as somebody who's not particularly personally religious now at mm -hmm. this point in my life. I look at and I mean, this is how I looked at it at the time. I looked at it as a story well told. I, yeah. you know, and, 
yeah, do you get all of the context of what was life was like, why Jesus was a threat in first person in first century Judea? No, you don't. But sure. if you did that, like we said, it would be a completely different movie. Mm-hmm. And you have to basically look at this movie and see how well it does what it sets out to do. And what does Gibson set out to do? He he sets out to show in the most brutal way imaginable God's sacrifice to humanity. Yeah. And that is, and it's powerful. Mm-hmm. Do I necessarily have a larger sense of connection to the story of Jesus because of it? No, I don't. Mm. I actually feel, I actually feel we, we talked about it on your podcast. I feel more of a connection with the way Jesus's story is told in the last temptation of Christ than I do in mm-hmm. the passion of the Christ. And part of that is because, and a big part of that is the way it's told the way Gibson oh, tells yeah. his story. It's very well done, mm-hmm. and seeing it again was really great because of the fact that I understood. I feel like I have a better understanding now of why he chose the flashbacks he did, and mm-hmm. what purpose they serve in the narrative that he tells. And mm-hmm. that's one of the things that is great about being able to go back to these movies time and time again, even if you, even if it's been like a decade or so since you've seen it that's when you're going to, you know, like you said, you're not the same person when you watched it in 2004 than you are when you watch it now. I'm not Mm -hmm. the same person I was in 2004 versus the way I am now. And I'm not the, I don't necessarily look at film the same way I did then compared to how I do now. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that, you know, movies... The movie stays the same, but the way it affects us changes. And that's Mm. one of the things that great films, whether regardless of the subject matter, will do. And I think that's one of the things that, to, to sort of put a bow on this topic that we've discussed on both of our shows now, as far as the the message versus the medium. Gibson Mm -hmm. found a way to put his message in a medium that resonated with millions upon millions of people. Mm -hmm. And it resonated in different ways. And he, while he's not a perfect individual, to a certain extent, he's a filmmaker who I feel like he does understand and he does... um, he does have a way of marketing that parti- the message that he wants to make in a way that people want to see. Yeah. And in that way he's he's like some several of the great filmmakers of our time. I wouldn't necessarily put him in the same level that I would like Anelia Kazan or Alfred Hitchcock or Kubrick mm-hmm. or something, but he has that gift in terms of the way he tells stories. And I am curious to see what he does with uh, with The Resurrection. I am curious to see that sequel. Mm. I, I agree with you. I don't necessarily think it will have the reach. Part of it, because of, you know, based on what you've said, it seems to be going more in the Catholic tradition that sure. you know, is going to lose a lot of the evangelical audience. And also, because of who Mel Gibson is and how his personal life has sort of exposed the demons that he's dealing with. Mm -hmm. And in a way, some of the deal, the demons that he, that inspired him to uh, search out Jesus in such a personal way, like he did with the passion. Mm. Um, no, I, th- I think you're right about that. And the, I, I, all I'll say is I remember one, one per- someone had told me this, and I think that in our talks about the difference between Christian cinema and like this movie, um, someone had once told me this, like, and I can't even remember the context of it. He said, better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like Christian cinema oftentimes gets to that point where it's all about 
almost this just looking to the skies or the heavens. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's like it's like this very passive. And this was very much an on your feet film. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very much in your face. Very much making risk. Very much making choices, good or bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it was at least trying something. Yes. No, and that's that's absolutely true. And I I think. I think the great filmmakers, especially when they touch on nature, on stories that touch on the spirit of man, the humanity of man, the 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 emotional life of man, and uh, just the what happens to a mortality and the issue mm-hmm. of mortality. I I think that comes through. I I think that's that's a powerful motivator for. Mm. filmmakers and i i think great filmmakers and great artists will understand why that's important to come into it as opposed to just sort of preaching to the choir which mm-hmm. i certainly don't think gibson is doing in this film i don't think Mm-mm. i i think he's he's swinging for the fences and he mm-hmm. he's telling a personal story in in a very profound and difficult way. And that's, that's one of the things that I've, I've always resonated with when it comes to this film. And, uh, it's, it's definitely something that came out for me when I watched it, uh, this for this time to watching it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't necessarily have too much else to say on the film. Uh, do you have anything else you, you want to add? Before we wrap no, up? I, I, I thought I thought you wrapped it up very, very well, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to go back um, and and watch it because I don't think that would have necessarily been in my Netflix queue or <laughs> uh, uh, you know on my to do list. Yeah, uh, but it was it, it was a good opportunity to do this, and I appreciate you uh, challenging me with that. Oh no problem, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, while we wrap up, uh, I'd like to thank Stuart Deloney for uh, joining me. Uh, Check out his podcast on whatever uh, podcast, uh, whatever you listen to podcasts on, uh, Snarky Faith. It's a lot of fun. It's really, uh, really enjoyable and irreverent, and uh, it's definitely given. It's definitely given me uh, some some things to think about and about issues of faith and sort of where we are right now as a uh, larger society when it comes to faith. And uh, thank you very much, Stuart, for joining me on this. And thank you for having me on your your podcast. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, it's been so much fun, man. It was my pleasure. Okay. And uh, I'm going to uh, cut out here and uh, rec- and stop the record and make sure everything's sure. good on my end. And then okay. I'll, uh, we'll just wrap things up right quick. Okay. Okay. I'd like to thank Stuart Delaney for joining me today. It was such a fun conversation with him. I hope to do it again, and we'll have more to uh, discuss. Coming up, uh, I don't know. I might have one more uh, podcast for this month. I Just just an idea I had uh, coming around um, after the Academy Awards. I'm not necessarily going to talk about the Oscars, there's not really a whole lot to say uh, afterwards. It's usually before that that you have more to say. So I might do that. I've also, you know, I'm getting ready to uh, come up with which uh, episodes we'll be doing in April for the Sonic Cinema podcast, as well as more rewards for the Patreon, as well as, you know, catching up on movies. I've got quite a few I need to do but thank you very much for joining me this is brian scuttle and until next time